and welcome to this session where we are going to talk about frameworks of public mental health and basically here we are going to understand the different factors that influence mental health and we are going to look at those biological factors, the psychological factors, the social factors, environmental factors and uh, we are also going to understand what the life course perspective of mental health is so there is no single factor that can determine our mental health which is why we want to understand that interplay between the four domains the biological the psychological the social and the environmental factors which could lead to mental illness or mental well-being so the biological factors that we talk about here include the neurotransmitters we had uh, highlighted about them in the first session the brain structure the genetics and and everything that influences emotions moods and vulnerability to mental illnesses so the different neurotransmitters uh, that we have which could be of significance in terms of mental health include serotonin uh, which is in, in charge of uh, <coughs> happiness, our mood and sleep meaning that uh, if we have imbalances in uh, this neurotransmitter then our happiness or our perception of activities or events that could lead to happiness will be disrupted which can lead to mental disorders and illnesses then if our sleep is disrupted ultimately our mental health is is not going to be good then dopamine is in charge of those pleasure activities uh, motivation and reward so perception of what brings you pleasure will be disrupted when you have low levels of dopamine and when they are also too much it could also be problematic then we have nora norepinephrine or what other people call noradrenaline and it is in charge of alertness focus and stress response so if you have disruption in this neurotransmitter also you are at risk of getting uh, stressed out and uh, losing focus or alertness then the other is the gamma aminobutyric acid which uh, it has an inhibitory effect in, uh, in terms of of, of, uh, of nerve impulse transmission so it uh, it impedes the receive <coughs> the receiving of of, uh, of these impulses or even firing them from one nerve cell to another and by doing that it uh, brings into play what we are calling calmness and relaxation so in some situations you need to be calm you need to be relaxed okay so if that cannot be if uh, gamma amino bitteric acid or what we are calling GABA is disrupted then you might uh, have problems with being calm or relaxed and yet it is very essential in our mental health so disruptions in uh, this neurotransmitter uh, levels <coughs> or the brain chemistry or the imbalances can contribute to mental health challenges also apart from the neurotransmitters we have those brain regions which are responsible for emotions and uh, behavior so ultimately damage to the above regions like the limbic system the prefrontal cortex and the thalamus will have an adverse mental health outcome and this damage can be due to some of those drugs which are abused like cocaine like uh, meth you know heroin and uh, marijuana so those drugs tend to damage these uh, regions and uh, and they could also end up causing adverse mental health outcomes then illnesses sometimes and uh, trauma could be a head injury that can uh, 
<coughs> bring damage to these regions that are responsible for emotions and behavior and will ultimately affect your mental health. Then the psychological factors that are in charge of uh, our mental health outcomes include the thoughts, which are mental representations of experiences, beliefs, expectations and goals. So how do you think? Do you have uh, a positive thought process or you have a negative one? You know, when, whenever you're faced with a challenge, uh, do you face it positively or you, you tend to dwell on the negative and if you tend to dwell on the negative if you are not hopeful if you are not going to be uh, a, prob a problem solver to get out of your challenges then you can end up with uh, those adverse mental health outcomes then the emotions which are subjective feelings arising from those thoughts the mood and interactions, you know, uh, are you are you happy? Are you sad? You know, and uh, how does it? How does that this go on? Does being sad take a long time? Does it take a toll on 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 your thoughts and mood? And if it does, how do you cope with it? Okay, which brings us to the coping mechanisms as a psychological factor what coping mechanisms or what strategies do you have to manage stress okay you as an individual before you even uh, think of enabling others to manage stress which strategies do you have can you take a break from a distressing event or situation are you able to exercise to deal with this stress you know are you able to talk to someone else that you trust and and maybe this will lessen your uh, your distressing situation or not. So the coping mechanisms, which are those strategies that uh, enable us to manage stress, adverse and negative emotions, are also some of the psychological factors that determine mental health. So meaning that uh, people who have more coping mechanisms, who have better coping mechanisms, at lower risk of uh, suffering these mental health uh, challenges. Then personality traits, and you are, uh, we have those enduring patterns of behavior, temperament and uh, motivation. Uh, what is your, your personality? Are you this person who has a borderline uh, personality who is always at risk of getting or uh, falling into mental illness or not? Are you the person who depends on others to feel happy or not. So what kind of personality are you having which could uh, uh, make a difference of whether you're going to have mental health challenges or not. So understanding yourself is very important such that uh, you can put in place proactive measures to prevent mental health challenges. Then the social factors that we are interested in here include basically the emotional support, um, emotional support that you can get from the people that are around you that will help to reduce stress and enhance coping skills, okay? So promoting that sense of belonging, identity, self-esteem and confidence can be a very good strategy for you to get the best out of the social system around you to manage mental health challenges. So forming strong social bonds through regular contact with the people around you, joining groups that are that that, that are supportive, you know, volunteering and seeking professional help is very important in terms of uh, of, of building a social structure that will buffer you when you face mental health challenges. All right, so we have looked at the biological factors, the psychological factors, the thoughts, the emotions, and uh, the mood, and also the social factors. Now, someone might think that uh, applying one uh, model will work, okay? Applying the social model perhaps will be very essential in uh, combating these mental health 
illnesses. Well, according to Dr. George Engel, uh, he thinks otherwise. He thinks that uh, for us to, to effectively manage mental health challenges, we need to look at it from uh, those three facets, okay? Hence what he called the biopsychosocial model. That you cannot just apply only the social factors and deal with mental health holistically. For you to deal with it holistically, you need to look at an individual or a community from those different facets, from the three facets of the biological, the psychological, and the social. So it is that framework for understanding the complex interplay of biological, psychological, and social factors in mental health and illness. So it recognizes interacting systems where we looked at uh, those biological factors, the genetics, you know, someone's uh, uh, family history, uh, if, if there is someone who has had a mental health challenge in your family, then you are at risk of, of also facing the same, so you need to be uh, aware of that and put in place measures to prevent yourself from getting the same. And then the brain chemistry as we looked at, uh, those neurotransmitters and then physical health where, where we look at those uh, chronic illnesses that predispose people to mental health illnesses and uh, one of them being uh, HIV, you know, uh, HIV AIDS, who was not managed well can cause mental health illnesses. Then we have uh, psychological factors, as we had discussed earlier, social factors, as we also looked at them. So the biopsychosocial model addresses all the relevant factors for each individual avoiding a one-size-fits-all. So you cannot say that you're going to use only one model and uh, you will effectively combat these mental health challenges. We need to address them from all facets, all dimensions, the biological, the psychological, and the social. And it also emphasizes patient self-awareness, knowing oneself, um, who are you, you know, uh, psychologically? How do you think? How do you manage your emotions? How do you cope with uh, stressing uh, events, you know? Then the life context, uh, uh, to which family do you belong? And uh, in relation to mental health, you know, um, are, you, are you physically well or not? Then the relationships with the people around you and healthcare providers from whom you seek uh, mental health help. So all those come into play and once you look at mental health from all those facets, you're able to deal with these challenges holistically and uh, it will help in bringing out the best outcome for this individual, for a community, or any other person having these mental health challenges. All right, so those are the major factors, but uh, the session continues, and uh, like we said, we are also going to look at the life course perspective, and this is the framework that really un uh, brings into understanding of mental health trajectories shaped by the life experiences and transitions, okay? So it recognizes the interplay of biological, the psychological, the social and environmental factors, but majorly it emphasizes three things, and those are the critical periods, the cumulative effects, and then linked lives, and we shall look at each uh, briefly. So the critical periods, as we have highlighted in uh, our past sessions, especially this the most previous session about mental development theories. Uh, I hope all of us have watched that video. If you haven't, then you need to go and watch and and acquaint yourself with those mental uh, development theories. But in essence, we are looking at those uh, periods which can determine whether we are going to be mentally well or not. In, in our future, okay? So those specific life stages where experiences have heightened 
impact on mental health trajectories. You know, like I was saying, um, there are those life stages where you have to be cautious, okay? Because experiences in those stages can determine whether a person is going to be mentally well or not in future, okay? So examples of those life stages include early childhood, um, like we highlighted earlier in, the, in that uh, session of mental development theories. We said that uh, in early childhood, we want to promote as much as possible secure attachment because we realize that if someone is... Uh, is able to enjoy this secure attachment from the people around them when they, when they are still a baby or a young child from the from the people around them like the caregiver or the family then they will end up being people who are more resilient who are emotionally stable and are going to be having a mental a, 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 a mental well-being okay so this is why those critical periods are very important and then we also understand that uh, it is essential for emotional development. And then the other critical period is uh, the adolescence. And this, um, according to that theory by Erickson, which says that in that adolescent stage, there is always a crisis between identity formation or identity confusion. This is the stage, according to uh, Erickson, when you go back to those uh, mental developmental theories where he was saying that in this stage of adolescence you're trying to ident to really uh, get to know who you truly are you know what you want to be your goal in future you know what do you envision being so in that case you need to be supported by the people around you by the teachers by the mentors around you so that you can really identify what, what you need to be. Because if you don't, then you will end up in that identity confusion. And remember, even at that stage, there is there is also uh, things like risk-taking behaviors coming into play. You're always influenced by the peer pressure to take drugs, to engage in alcohol, in alcoholism. So if you cannot identify what you really want to be and you strive towards that, then these risk-taking behaviors will come into play and you will end up wasting of your life or facing these mental health challenges, okay? So it is very essential to take note of those critical periods as suggested by this life course perspective. Then the other essential part that is uh, highlighted by this life course perspective is the cumulative effects how those experiences across life stages build upon each other with positive and negative consequences. So, for example, childhood trauma can contribute to vulnerabilities in later life, okay? So if you have been traumatized as a child, if you have gone through uh, violence as a child, you know, those people who are raped, who are, uh, who are beaten up whenever they are children, they tend to, li to live a life of self-doubt, of low self-esteem, and this can impact very highly on their mental health, okay? These are the people who end up having uh, unstable relationships in future where they cannot trust the other person, okay? They, they are the people who are at risk of ending up committing suicide because they do not feel worthy, they do not feel... Uh, uh, meaning in this life okay so all those are very essential and they are, they form what we are calling the cumulative effects according to this life course perspective okay so why there are those negative uh, consequences arising from these negative cumulative effects whenever you you have these positive cumulative effects uh then you end up with uh, better resilience, better emotional stability, and this can arise from when you have strong social connections around you. Then the third aspect of this life course perspective is what we call linked lives. And basically this is talking about the interconnectedness between individuals and their communities, okay? So for us to say that we are mentally well, then our community from where we are coming should also be 
well okay so if you are coming from a community or a family <coughs> which is uh, at war which is uh, in conflict then the possibility of you being mentally well is very low so that interconnectedness of individual and communities according to this life course perspective is what we are called calling uh, the linked lives so basically we are trying to say that as public health professionals as public mental health practitioners we should focus on making sure that the community the family from which the person is coming is well so that we can be sure that this individual is also going to be well in terms of mental health all right so the implication of this life course a perspective which has talked about uh, the cumulative effects which can be positive or negative which has talked about the critical periods um, uh, where we looked at those uh, periods like the adolescence and uh, childhood where you need attachment where you need to identify yourself and also it has brought about that linked lives between the community and the individual the implication of this life course perspective in our public health is that uh, we should consider these interweaving threads okay early intervention during critical periods knowing how to take care of the baby knowing how to take care of this young child and uh, addressing those cumulative uh, effects across the lifespan those are uh, um, risk factors that could lead to trauma to, to, to those negative cumulative effects and promoting supportive environments will help us to nurture li linked lives and this will be crucial for promoting population-wide mental well-being okay so let us look at uh, some of these uh, periods and uh, maybe what can be done so a critical period like childhood we need uh, to have secure attachment and this can be formed during that period between birth and three years and uh, during that period the exposures that can be there are that supportive and responsive parenting which helps us to form that secure attachment but also on the negative side is that if you are not having that secure attachment if you are not exposed to that secure attachment through supportive and responsive parenting then you could be exposed to violence or neglect so in that case you will be having insecure attachment okay so that insecure attachment will have an effect or an adverse effect on your mental health in future these are the individuals who will end up uh, having unstable relationships, emotional instability, because they did not enjoy this secure attachment. So the public inter health intervention in this case can be early childhood development programs, which emphasize the importance of this secure uh, attachment formation, parent education to also make sure that they develop the love for their children because this love will enable the children to become better human beings in future and also shield them from mental health challenges in the future then trauma-informed care to to basically uh, prevent these traumatizing events that could affect the mental health of these children whenever they are growing up and uh, so if we put in place such interventions and even more we are going to ensure that children undergo secure attachment formation during that critical period and this will enable them to have a better mental health outcome in future then uh, the other period of it could be adolescence which involves identity formation and emotional regulation and exposures in this case like we had highlighted earlier on include peer pressure include academic stress <coughs> and uh, substance abuse so you could fall into this if you haven't identified who you really want to be according to the other theory by Erickson okay so that peer pressure the, the friends around you if they are not good enough 
if they are not the ones that will support you to achieving your goals, then you could uh, end up having uh, uh, problems with uh, substance use, alcoholism, smoking, and all the others. But, uh, <clears throat> but as public health professionals, we need to ensure that there, there is school-based mental health services so that even when these uh, adolescents are away from home, they can be counseled, they can be taught on how to deal with these uh, pressures from the peers, from the, from, from, from the society, so that they can really identify who they really want to be and they can go through this period productively so that they can have a better mental health outcome. Then we can have youth empowerment programs uh, to focus on improving their their emotional management, but also creating opportunities for them so that they do not fall into substance abuse, okay? Then access to culturally competent care that will take into consideration the different cultures and what that means in terms of mental health outcomes. So these are very important public health interventions in terms of uh, dealing with mental illnesses that could arise due to mismanagement of that critical period uh, that happens around adolescence. All right, so we also said that uh, the life course uh, perspective talks about those cumulative effects and in this case we have the positive cumulative effects and the negative cumulative effects. Those <coughs> factors that build on onto each other to cause or influence our mental health okay so the positive ones include access to education and quality jobs so if you have access to education you're more likely to have a good job if you have a good job you're more likely to take care of yourself and end up with a better mental uh, health then uh, we have strong social support networks very essential in terms of creating that buffer for mental health okay people that you can talk to that can support you when you are having uh, uh, an issue that is bothering you instead of falling into mental illnesses those are what we are calling the strong social support networks then culturally informed mental health services not the one which gives everyone the same kind of care but it has to take care of those cultures the different the differences in, in in cultures so that everyone receives what they truly deserve and what is meant for them okay then the negative cumulative effects on the other hand include poverty and discrimination which which impact very highly on accessibility of these uh of these mental health uh, services but also before even access they create that sense of uh, th that uh, th that effect of, 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 of stress you know hopelessness um, which ultimately leads to those mental health illnesses then the adverse childhood experiences like we had said are very essential and we cannot downplay them you know uh, the trauma that you can face during child, uh, childhood, the insecure attachment, which can have a toll on your emotional stability and, and, and the relationship with others. And yet we have recognized that we need to relate very well with others so that we can gain from that strong social support system. Then the other negative cumulative effect is when there is limited access to healthcare and resources such that even when you have a mental health illness or if you are faced with a mental health challenge, you cannot get any support from a professional uh, mental health practitioner because there is limited access or even the healthcare that is present is very expensive and not affordable by everyone. All right, so the life course approach to public mental health uh, makes us really want to intervene early during those critical periods like we are saying educate these parents okay let them acknowledge the importance of of of, uh, of these 
attachment uh, so that we can have better mental health outcomes for these children whenever they when they are grown and then uh, during uh, during adolescence uh, there are those programs that empower youth uh, there are school mental health uh, programs that 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 protect these youth from falling into uh, issues of drug abuse you know falling into traps by peer pressure so all those are interventions in critical periods and then addressing the cumulative effects throughout life how are you addressing discrimination for these uh, mental services you know how are you addressing stigma how are we going to address uh, poverty so that we can have everyone accessing these mental health, uh, mental health services but also shielding them from suffering from their mental health uh, illnesses you know so addressing these cumulative effects uh, through uh, sustainable livelihood programs through creating uh, jobs that can make these people get an earning that is uh, good enough to help them get out of this poverty educating them so that they can be better positioned to get jobs it will be very essential in addressing such cumulative effects then promoting supportive environments and linked lives is also very important and then prioritizing equity and social justice in mental health care such that everyone regardless of who they are where they come from can access quality mental health care whenever they are in need of that care all right another essential thing that we are looking at in this session is uh, the early life experiences which is basically trying to look at or build on that critical period aspect and uh, we are saying that these experiences have lasting effects on the brain development stress regulation and attachment patterns okay the way your brain develops is uh, dependent on how uh, your early life experiences were did you feed well were you cared for very well was there a secure attachment whenever you, when you were growing up and and also it goes into stress re regulation how are you able to regulate stress do you have better do you have better coping mechanisms whenever you're faced with distressing situations okay uh, attachment patterns such that uh, which influence whether you are going to have a good social support system or not then uh, we also recognize that uh, adverse childhood experiences or what we are calling the SCEs increase the risk of mental disorders so protective factors such as supportive uh, relationships positive coping skills and resilience will buffer the impact of these adverse childhood experiences okay so if you have better protective uh, factors like supportive relationships if you have positive coping skills like the ones that we talked about uh, if you can talk to another person that you trust about these mental health challenges if you can exercise if you can eat well whenever you're facing these mental health challenges if you can withdraw from this dist distressing situation and you take time to to be to, to to really take care of yourself and not be so hard on yourself if you are hopeful during those uh, adverse situations and you have positive coping skills and this will buffer the impact of the early childhood experiences so even when you had those adverse uh, childhood experiences if you have better coping skills if you have protective factors and if you are resilient enough then the impact of these SCEs will not be as great then the other aspect is ongoing challenges and mental health and when we talk about ongoing challenges we are we are looking at uh, aspects like poverty 
discrimination, violence, and chronic illnesses which really affect mental health across the life course. So these challenges create stress, they reduce the resources available, they limit opportunities for personal growth and also social participation, okay? If you are discriminated against, if you are poor, then even your social capital tends to reduce the people that you can really talk to and they can, and, and be of help might not be as many as when you have the resources when you have when you are not poor you know so coping strategies such as problem solving emotion regulation and social support will help individuals manage those challenges and maintain mental health then the other aspect that is important in this case is the social determinants of health and these are the non-medical factors which influence health, health outcomes we look at the factors during birth <coughs> factors during growth your work you are living during aging and systemic conditions these have significant impact on mental health inequalities and uh, we recognize that mental health is influenced by those social, e social, economic, and physical environments at different stages. Factors like poverty, uh, we are going to keep on talking about this because you see, poverty does not only uh, stop you from accessing quality mental health services, but also can lead you to mental health illnesses, okay? The fact that you are poor means that you're more likely to face uh, those challenging situations. So these challenging situations can lead you into depression, okay? Depression, anxiety, and all the other mental disorders and mental illnesses that come after that. So poverty, discrimination, lack of resources contribute greatly to mental health disparities um harsh parenting bullying you know at school or even in society economic down downturns and disease outbreaks all these factors uh, are embedded in the social determinants of health or what we are calling the sdoh and they have great impact on our mental health so as public health professionals, we need to see how do we turn around these factors, okay? How do we create um, a situation where poverty is reduced, where discrimination is no longer present, where people have resources in terms of capital, in terms of, uh, of, 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 human, of, of, of human capital, of uh, the natural capital, those resources that we need to survive. So how do we increase these resources so that, so that these people can be shielded from these mental health challenges? So we talked about earlier things like sustainable livelihood programs, okay? These ones that empower people to have, to produce more, to engage in activities that can get them out of poverty, you know, so those sustainable uh, livelihood programs, um, awareness creation to, to prevent discrimination of, of, of people who are mentally ill or who are having uh, those mental health challenges can also be very essential in, 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 uh, in preventing or managing these challenges so as to have a better mental health situation in our communities and uh, societies so addressing these mental health inequalities is essential to is essential so that we can have mental health promotion protection and restoration and it requires action just beyond the health sector as you you as you can uh, imagine if we are going to eliminate poverty from our societies then we cannot only use the health sector alone the health sector can only do little in terms of eliminating these social determinants of health in terms of eliminating uh, those, uh, those those cultural determinants of health those uh, 
uh, issues of discrimination. So we need to involve all the actors, multiple sectors and stakeholders so as to create a better social environment to deal with mental health inequalities, okay? <clears throat> so the social economic factors and mental health and the relationship between income, poverty, education and mental health outcome is very essential for us to to look at those social economic factors because people who have low income are less likely to to have access to these mental health services but also are more likely to fall into mental health challenges of depression anxiety and all the other disorders poverty we cannot talk about it exhaustively but we have already touched on how it uh, increases vulnerability to these mental health challenges. Education, person who is not educated might not understand what mental health even is. So these are the people that will not even seek for these mental uh, health services. And when, uh, when they don't, they will have those adverse effects of these mental health illnesses and disorders. So. But also remember that if you are not educated, chances are high that you are not going to get a job. If you are not going to get a job, you might fall into poverty and this poverty will ultimately lead to adverse effects of mental health. And therefore, these low socioeconomic statuses, uh, poverty, low education, low income, they cause chronic stress, they limit opportunities and they lower self-esteem and these are not very good in terms of mental health. So they also impact on the risk of mental disorders and access to care. So how do we promote mental health equity? Uh, economic inequalities contribute to mental health disparities. So reducing poverty, like I was saying, and improving education can enhance mental health or mental well-being. So creating those uh, livelihood programs in which everyone can produce and sell and get some income for themselves, you know, putting in place uh, an education that is universal, that enables everyone to access quality education can be very good in terms of managing these <coughs> mental health challenges okay so addressing the social determinants of health is essential for achieving mental health equity as we had highlighted earlier on then we have issues of race ethnicity and culture also among the social determinants of health and uh, these are complex ways there are complex ways in which race ethnicity and and culture can affect mental health and we recognize that uh, marginalized communities face system, systemic racism, cultural stigma, and discrimination. You know, um, you can imagine the situation, for example, in the United States, where there is uh, still some elements of racism, but also in other countries where the black people are, uh, are always victimized in terms of racism okay so this goes a long way even in terms of their access to these mental health services and you find that they are going to be uh, discriminated against sometimes they are not going to receive the care that they deserve you know some hospitals are not going to attend to them but even in the societies themselves they are discriminated against okay there are some opportunities that they are not going to get some job opportunities some education opportunities then there is also that cultural stigma stigmatizing them creating a very harsh social environment for them might lead them to uh, end up getting mentally ill but also when they are ill they are not going to get the services that can lead them to to, to being mentally well okay so it is very important as public health professionals to look into how 
to put in place culturally competent mental care that takes into consideration of all these groups of cultures that are present in our society so that everyone gets what they need and what fits well in their context. Then gender and mental health is also very important because mental health challenges and vulnerabilities vary across genders, women, men and those non-binary or transgender individuals face different mental health challenges, okay? Women are always uh, disproportionately affected by uh, gender-based violence, they are beaten up and not expected to report because that is their culture. You know, there are even some cultures where they promote this battering of women and they are never expected to report to this. Then when you look at men, uh, the society de demands a lot from them, okay? It demands a lot in terms of provision for the for the for the family, being the sole breadwinner of the family, but also always being masculine in the face of these challenges. You are not expected to break down even when you're faced by these challenges, and this is very very essential in terms of looking at the mental health of men. Men are not expected to go to the hospital because they are feeling. Uh, stressed, they are feeling depressed, you know, in many cultures they are supposed to be masculine and and, and be strong, never to to break down, so these are, uh, these, these stereotypes, these are, uh, the, these expectations, the, the, the very uh, primitive expectations from society sometimes will predispose these uh, gender to mental health challenges. Then when you look at uh, these transgender individuals, the non-binary individuals, they tend to be discriminated against in most societies and this can lead to mental health challenges also. So the influence of uh, gender roles, expectations and societal pressures is, uh, is, is very essential in understanding gender and mental health. So promoting gender equity is very essential for mental well-being and in this case we encourage the importance of challenging harmful stereotypes, those stereotypes that uh, men are supposed uh, to be very masculine and not to break down, never to be seen seeking for help whenever they are stressed, you know, uh, things like uh, the, the, the uh, women not reporting issues of gender-based violence because they are meant to be harassed. You know, those harmful stereotypes need to be challenged. Then the strategies for promoting mental well-being for all genders, such that no particular gender is left behind or discriminated against. Um, encouraging emotional expression, seeking help, like we are saying. Uh, men should not shy away from seeking for help whenever they are depressed or feeling down and then supporting each other in terms of mental health journeys, okay, is very essential. So in low and middle income countries, ultimately we always face challenges of mental health uh, at a greater a percentage than in those developed countries. This is because we have poverty, we have conflict, we have uh, cultural stigma, we have limited resources which are still prevalent in our countries and this ultimately contributes to mental health disparities. So economic challenges limit investment in mental health challenges, in mental health services and this increases exposure to stressors. Okay. And there is also that vicious cycle of poor mental health and poverty. Poverty leading to mental health uh, challenges and then the fact that you cannot <coughs> afford quality care, you will fall into those adverse effects of these mental illnesses which will even make you more poor. You know, so that vicious cycle which is characterized by people being poor because they are not producing anything, you know, they are not producing because they have no capital, because they are not producing, they are poor, 
uh, because they are poor, they cannot, they, they fall into depression because they, they are depressed, they will end up with those mental health illnesses and when they are mentally ill, they cannot even do more production, they are not productive at all. So that vicious cycle of, of poor mental health and poverty uh, creates, uh, it affects individuals, families and communities, especially in the low and middle income countries like the ones that we live in. So there is an urgent need for global collaboration to address these mental health inequalities so that everyone everywhere can achieve or can attain and access quality mental health services whenever they need them. So actions including increasing funding, integrating mental health into primary care like we highlighted in, the, in that first session such that even at the lowest health center in the country, we are having some aspect of mental health, okay? At least there should be some counseling room when, where you can go to and face a professional psychologist, talk to them, and you receive this professional care, but also receive drugs in case situation uh, warrants that. Then uh, culturally appropriate interventions, and uh, empowerment of people with lived experiences and research is very essential in terms of addressing these mental health inequalities, okay? It's very essential to empower these people with lived experiences because we can always gain uh, a lot of insight into how it feels when you are having these mental health illnesses, but also uh, the importance of seeking help because some people fear to go to the hospital whenever they are having those mental health challenges but if people with lived experiences can demystify these uh, services then more people will go there and the impact of stigma and discrimination uh, is that uh, the negative effects it, it has negative effects on mental health experiences and access to care because it causes shame causes isolation, fear, rejection, and it prevents people from seeking for help whenever they are faced with these mental health challenges. But also, if there is stigma and discrimination, especially in those uh, community settings like schools, then adherence to treatment might not be very good, okay? People might fear taking out their drugs or uh, mental illnesses because they will be subjected to this stigma. So how do we combat this? We combat this by raising awareness, by challenging those stereotypes and promoting mental health literacy so that people know about what these mental health challenges are. They do not relate them to things like witchcraft or curses. So they should have this knowledge which, which will uh, ultimately uh, convert into empathy. They can be able to acknowledge how this person facing a mental health challenge is feeling, okay? And then ultimately they will be supported and it will reduce these negative attitudes. So inclusive and accessible mental health care include, uh, is essential for all people to ensure that there is right to mental health and well-being. And this mental health care, which is inclusive and accessible, it will provide appropriate, timely, and effective care, which reduces barriers and disparities. So mental health, uh, up to this point, we recognize that it is a very vital public health component. And why is that so? It's because mental health challenges affect well-being, they affect productivity and resilience of individuals, and communities at large, okay? So if we are having an unproductive community, an individual, or a community that is not well because of these mental health challenges, then the public health is affected. So integrating mental health into public health strategies can reduce stigma, it can increase awareness, but also enhance prevention, it can increase access to these mental health uh, services, 
and promote the recovery of individuals who face these mental health illnesses. We also need to recognize the importance of collaboration. Collaboration uh, for effective mental health solutions and this can be between the mental health professionals who will treat these people who have mental health illnesses or disorders and then public health officials who are in charge of taking this message to the community, you know, raising awareness and demystifying the subject of mental health, okay? Linking the, 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 the mental health uh, services and then the community. And then we have community organizations that mobilize the communities to come and listen to these messages to, to ensure that they create social support to eliminate stigma in the community and create that social support system for these people who face mental health challenges. And then identifying uh, needs, uh, developing evidence-based policies, mobilizing resources and sharing best practices are also crucial and can only be achieved through effective collaboration for mental health solutions. So the role of public health systems in mental health uh, is to promote uh, preventive program. Uh, it is to promote these preventive programs that uh, effectively manage uh, mental health challenges even before they come into place. Uh, early intervention so that people are managed before they get those worse mental health outcomes and then accessible mental services for each and every person who needs them. So strengthening uh, protective factors, reducing vulnerability to stressors, providing timely care and improving quality of life is a very essential role for public health systems in mental health. So in conclusion, we realize that uh, <clears throat> we have a lot of factors that influence mental health okay so we need to acknowledge these factors and uh, look at putting in place strategies that that, that uh, really tackle these factors holistically without just <clears throat> facing only one okay we need to look at the biological the sociological the social factors the psychological factors the environmental factors how do we address those critical periods, the cumulative effects, you know, those uh, linked lives so that we can create a, a, a robust mental health system that deals with those biological factors, the social uh, factors, and uh, the environmental factors plus the psychological factors that affect mental health so that we have that mental health system which is uh, preventive in nature, promotive in nature, but also intervenes early in terms of these mental illnesses and also creates that equity so that everyone everywhere can access quality mental health services. So thank you so much for being with me today. Uh, we discussed these uh, frameworks of mental health where we understood the factors that really affect mental health and in the subsequent sessions we are now going to look at those mental health disorders themselves the mental health illnesses and understand how they can appear and how we can deal with them so thank you again and i wish you the best of the day